today on What It's Like out in Eastern Ohio to take a look at this 1959 Edsel Corsair four-door hardtop that belongs to a viewer of the channel. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. Picture this. You just obtained a classic car you know nothing about, perhaps. It's a lost, forgotten, off the beaten path classic car the big channels don't care to cover. We feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that often get lost in the shuffle. If that sounds like a channel that you'd totally dig, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Let's talk 1959 Edsel lineup. But, but wait, wait a second. Let's let's go back for a second because we are getting kind of ahead of ourselves. For those that don't know what Edsel was, Edsel was a make that was offered by Ford, but it was only offered for three years, 1958, 1959, 1960. Why did Ford need four brands? Well, technically, Ford was wanted five brands to compete with both GM and Chrysler. GM with Cadillac, Buick, Oldsmobile, Pontiac, Chevy, and Chrysler with Imperial, Chrysler, DeSoto, Plymouth, and Dodge. And I know you're sitting there, but Jay, if Ford had Edsel as a brand, that's only four brands. Well, they technically had another brand called Continental, and it was meant to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Cadillac and Imperial, but Continental lost money on every single car that they sold, so they didn't even make it to 1958. By 1958, the Continental brand was absorbed into the Lincoln brand itself. They still made Continental cars, but it was underneath the Lincoln brand. It is a very confusing history. Maybe if I'm brave, maybe one day I will tackle that, because some people still say that they're Continentals. Other people say that Continental, the only car that Continental ever made was the Mark II, but you'll have other people say the Mark III was made by Continental. Super confusing lineage with the Continental name, but we're just going to leave it at that today. Let's talk about market position of the Edsel line. So in 1958, it was Ford, Mercury, Edsel, Lincoln. Think MEL. But by 1959, they moved Edsel down market and put it in between Ford and and Mercury. So it was Ford, Edsel, Mercury, Lincoln, which confused buyers because nobody knew what they were getting. 1959 Edsel model lineup was broken down into two car lines, the Ranger as like, I guess you could call it a junior series and a Corsair as the senior series, but it's important to note that they did not have different wheelbase lengths like they did in 58. It was just one body for this car. And the Villager was the sole wagon option, but could be had as a six-passenger or nine-passenger configuration. 1959 Corsair could be had as a two-door hardtop, two-door convertible, four-door sedan, or four-door hardtop. Let's talk specs. 210 inches long, 79.8 inches wide, 56.2 inches tall. It rides a wheelbase of 120 inches. It weighs 3,710 pounds. Price $2,884.50, which is equivalent to you spending $29,540.06 in the year 2022. Total 1959 Edsel production was 44,891 units. And I'm going to break this all down for you. Two-door hardtops, they made 2,315 units. Two-door convertibles, 1,343 units. Four-door sedan, 3,301 units. And the four-door hardtop, which our car is... 1,694 units. So total 1959 Corsair production was 8,653 units. So crazy statistic that I found about the production number of the 1958 Edsel line, 44,891 units sounds like a lot, but Ford sold more two-door ranch wagons than the total production of 1958 Edsels, which is crazy to me, which I find absolutely peculiar because I've always seen 59 Edsels. They're around. I've never saw a 1958 59 Ford two-door ranch wagon and they made more of those than they did Edsel's but for whatever reason I, I never saw one in the comment section below what do you guys think of that moving on to engines two engines on offer 332 cubic inch displacement express v8 5.4 liters it's good for 225 horsepower 325 foot pounds of torque compression 8.87 to 1 it was fed with a single two barrel carburetor all right, so getting into some specs of this engine made into different transmissions, but before we get into the specs, these are baseline numbers. One must think of the car as an equation. Tires, good tune, rear end, all of that will affect zero to 60 time as well as fuel consumption. And real quick, so Edsel offered six rear end gears in 1959, 269, 291, 389, 370, 
356, 310. So there's six different configurations just with the rear end gear alone, plus the three transmissions they offered. They offered the three speed manual, Milo-Matic two speed automatic, or the dual power automatic three speed automatic, but it was only available as an option on the Super Express V8. 332 cubic inch displacement Express V8 when mated to a three speed manual transmission, zero to 60 could be had in 10.2 seconds. It'll do the quarter mile, 17.9 seconds. Top speed was a theoretical 104 miles per hour. Average fuel consumption, somewhere around 12.3 miles to the gallon. If it was mated to the Milomatic, two speed automatic, zero to 60, 12 seconds. It'll do the quarter mile, 19 seconds. Top speed theoretically is 108 miles per hour. Average fuel consumption, 12.7 miles to the gallon. Moving to the second engine option, 361 cubic inch displacement, Super Express V8, 5.9 liters. It's good for 303 horsepower, 390 foot pounds of torque, compression 10 to one, fed with a single four barrel carburetor. When mated to the three speed, Automatic transmission, zero to 60 could be had in 8.9 seconds. It'll do the quarter in 16.6 seconds. Theoretical top speed, 120 miles per hour. Average fuel consumption, 11 miles to the gallon. When mated to the Milo-Matic two-speed automatic, zero to 69.8 seconds. Does the quarter mile, 17.3 seconds. Theoretical top speed, 120 miles per hour. Average fuel consumption, 11.4 miles to the gallon. All right, let's talk about this door panel. Just check out how it's designed. Look at how this comes up underneath here. Here's the vent window and it operates like this. So just check out that. I always like the vent window styling that Ford had in the late 50s. It's a really cool design. And I don't know if you heard that, we're, we're next to the highway, but when you put it back, it clicks when the button pops out. It's really cool. This is the door handle to get out. This is the window crank for the big window and it operates like this. And just notice it's all trimmed out. Nice quality feature. This is a four door hard top. So it does not have a post in the center. It's, uh, it's almost like a hard top convertible is what they called them back in the day. And this is how the, the rear window would operate. It goes up like that. Just look at how big that piece of glass is. And the gasket, I was looking for the driver's side door, but the gasket's on this. So when you shut the door, that's how the water stays out. Cause these two, it almost makes a seam. Here's the armrest, as well as door handle to pull the door shut. Just notice what materials this is made out of. Almost feels like a vinyl material. Coming down inside the pedal box down here. This is a toggle switch that controls the mirror. It's got an aftermarket temperature gauge. This is hood release. Brake, gas pedal. Just notice the transmission tunnel isn't that pronounced. It's not very big, but very wide I should say. That's my hand for reference. On to the button switches and knobs starting on the left, but on the bottom, ignition, headlights, right air vent, fuel gauge is just above that, oil pressure, which is in the form of an idiot light, speedometer, which kind of sits in the background, and it's flanked on each side by turn signal indicators, odometer at the bottom of the speedometer, drive select modes, read, park, reverse, neutral, drive, low, generator, which is a light, water temperature, left air vent, wipers, lighter, climate controls, which are essentially heat, defrost, and ventilation, radio, and clock. So that's what the door sounds like when it's closed. Here's over the hood impression. Here is what first person and over the hood would look like. This is what I look like behind the wheel. Lots of headroom. And, and that's, that's the way these cars are because a lot of people back in the day, they wore hats, sun hats. So you had to have a lot of head space to wear the hat. This is what under the steering wheel looks like. I'm six foot two, I wear size pants, 34, 34 waist, and there's tons of space underneath the steering wheel.
Okay, on to the glove box test. There is our test subject. Here is my hand for reference. This is the uh, cinematic camera that we use for all of the cinematic shots. We're going to put it in this glove box here. Oh man, just check out how big that glove box is. It's absolutely massive. And look, it fits right in there. No problem at all. Getting inside the rear door. So this is the door panel of the back. Armrest is clear back here. This is the door handle to get out. This is the window crank for the big window. And it goes up like that. But just check out how much space you have to get in. But also, I love showing this. This, is, this post is the only thing that holds this door, this rear door on here. And just look at how sturdy it is. Like I'm really moving, moving it. It does not flex or bend. Right, sitting in the back seat of the Corsair, lots, there's tons of headroom. You could wear a sun hat, top hat, whatever you wanted to wear back here. And and I get it, That that that's what people wore back in the day. They wore hats, but I'm just showing you that if you wanted to wear a hat, you could. Also, there is tons, tons of space back here. It's almost like being in a DeSoto. Here's my hand for reference of how much space there is back here. There is an ashtray, and, and that's about it for creature comforts. There is a dome light up there, as well as coat hooks on both sides. This is what the rear visibility looks like out the back window, and I love the fact that it's a wraparound windshield. And notice how it, it kind of curves back around back here, so it's not completely straight across. It's almost like, it almost looks like a rear sun visor in ways. Here's what the back to front view looks like. I just want to show you how this door closes. So notice this piece here, it connects with this piece up here. And when you shut the door, it's just really cool. Like people just don't engineer stuff like this anymore. So just wanted to show you these keys real quick. This is the key for the trunk and this is the key for the ignition. 59 Ford key. I love this key chain. So getting to the trunk, it's got this nice key cover. All right, so this is the trunk. Look how massive this trunk is. It's absolutely huge. All that space that you can fit. Like, look at how big it is. Like, that's a cooler, full size cooler there. All right, so we popped the hood from the inside and then there's a catch right here, right above the horse collar grill. Just take a look at that engine. It's got the master cylinders right there. No, no power brake booster assist. On to the pros and cons section. I am getting all of these pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars. Blue chip auto investments, 70 years from 1930 to 2000 by Richard M. Langworth and the auto editors of Consumer Guide. On the positive side, less unique appearance than the 1958s, but possibly more successful. Most models still in good supply against it. Less distinctive Edsel than the 58s. Won't ever appreciate as much either though convertibles aren't cheap now. I think, I think they've come into their own right. I wasn't a huge 59 Edsel's fan when I was a kid, but they are growing on me, especially the wagons. I really like the way that the wagons look. Anyway, on to Name That Tune. I am looking for the first person that will give me both the correct name of the band as well as song title, both to do first correctly, will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. That is my favorite part of this song, is that buildup and how it tumbles over after the part that you heard. Totally cool song. I almost gave it away. Anyway, thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. I really appreciate all of the continued support. 
If you'd like to get in touch with me, check out the Facebook group. You don't do Facebook, shoot a comment in the comment section below. I read and answer all comments posted. And until next time, toodaloo!